Next on Unsolved Mysteries. A young man is found shot to death in his car. Everyone is a suspect, except the real killer. In North Carolina, a night of drinking and joyriding suddenly turns vicious. A young mother is thrown to her death. Ira Einhorn, he was a counterculture hero until his girlfriend turned up dead in his closet. Gettysburg, the turning point of the Civil War. Some say the ghosts of the fallen soldiers are still haunting the battlefield. These are chilling cases that you won't want to miss. I'm Dennis Farina, and for the next hour, this is Unsolved Mysteries. The George Washington National Forest in Virginia. It's peaceful and inviting. Until the body of 26-year-old Sammy Wheeler is discovered in the backseat of his SUV. He has been shot six times in the head and upper torso. The killer has gone to great lengths to clean the crime scene. All shell casings and fingerprints have been removed. There was an apparent uh, effort to try and uh, ignite the vehicle. The gas cap had been open, and it apparently a uh, cigarette uh, laid there lit in an effort to try. There was some burning around there, but it, it didn't ignite and didn't take effect. When investigators discover that Sammy's wallet is missing, the murder looks like a random act of violence. But before long, police learned that at least three people might have wanted Sammy dead. His twin brother, Danny, Sammy's girlfriend, Pat Sneed, and Pat's estranged husband, Bob Bean. What began as a routine investigation quickly became a classic case of love, lies, and murder. It all started when Sammy Wheeler began dating Pat Sneed. At the time, Pat was leaving her husband, Bob Bean, and taking her two sons with her. They moved into a rental unit owned by Sammy's twin brother, Danny. Pat and her boys lived in one apartment with Sammy, and Danny lived in one of the others. The arrangement worked for everyone, except Bob Bean. The situation was not really what was in the best interest of my children. I had approached Pat and, and asked her to please stop this living arrangement here, okay? Bob got a court order that prohibited Sammy from being with Pat near her sons. So Sammy moved into his brother's apartment. But Bob Bean was still suspicious, and he hired a private investigator to keep an eye on Sammy. I never harbored any ill will at all towards Sam. People around here have a hard time understanding how a man can accept that his wife is leaving him for another man. Well, to be honest with you, I knew what I had, and I was thankful to pass it on, OK? Bob hated Sam. Sam knew it, and I knew it. Bob says otherwise, because I believe Bob is a pathological liar. Sam expressed to me that he felt that my ex-husband, Bob, was capable of pretty much anything. He did not trust him. Four days before he was murdered, Sammy left Danny's apartment early in the morning and ran into Bob Bean's teenage son from a previous marriage. Come here. What are you doing? Just taking a few pictures. Yeah, I see that. Will you tell your dad I'm staying in the apartment, OK? With Danny. I'm not in the house. I'm not okay. with Pat. I'm not okay. with the kids. I'm with my brother in the apartment, just like I'm supposed okay. to be. I thought that was very, very strange for somebody to be taking my twin brother's photograph at 5.30 in the morning. I didn't like it at all. That same Saturday at around 9.15 PM, Sammy set off for Elkhorn Lake roughly 40 miles from his house. He planned to sleep in his truck and begin fishing early the next day. 12 hours later, Sammy Wheeler 
was dead. I believe Bob Bean had a motive to kill my brother. Pat's divorce from Bob was going to be final on Tuesday. They were going to be married on Thursday. Sammy was killed on Sunday, just by coincidence, just by coincidence. Sure it was, sure it was a coincidence, sure it was. Go talk to the people who know me and ask them if I was really upset if Pat was leaving. Okay, the answer to that is no. So there's no motive. On the face of it, Bob Bean was the perfect suspect, but he also had the perfect alibi. When Sammy was murdered, Bob Bean was on maneuvers with his Army National Guard unit. One of our men from our department at the time was in the same unit and remember seeing Bob there. So things checked out pretty good for him. I feel like that Bob Bean knew just as soon as Sam Wheeler was found dead, he knew they were gonna come knocking on his door. So he knew that he better have his story right. Danny Wheeler believes that Bob Bean gave the photographs that his teenage son took to a professional hitman. You'd have to pay for the hitman, and the FBI investigated my finances, and I don't have quite what it takes to pay a professional. There was uh, nothing at all to support the theory of Bob hiring someone that just didn't go anywhere with the investigation. Bob Bean was cleared, so now he could point the finger at his ex-wife, Pat. As far as alibis go, the only one who really doesn't have an alibi is Pat. Then, Pat and Bob's sons began talking about the murder with surprisingly accurate details. He was in a trooper. That's right. He was found in his car. We went to the mountain. You did? When did you go to the mountains? When Sam got shot. You At first, I didn't think much of it. But later on, they started getting a little bit more specific. Hey, now let me just make sure that the camera's working all right. Bob Bean even videotaped his sons and then presented the tape to the police. Now, who was there when Sam died? Mommy. Mommy was there? I believe Bob is a very, very sick man. The fact that he would put his kids in the position that he has, his little two and three year old children at that time, through what he put them through, proves that he has no scruples, no morals, he cares about no one, not, all, not even his own flesh and blood, little infant children. He is a sick, sick man. The police dismissed the boy's testimony as unreliable and also believed that Pat had an airtight alibi. I'll see you later. I'm going to be in the living room if you need anything. The night that Sam was killed, I was at home with my two children. I had absolutely no motive to kill Sam Wheeler. Sam and my children were my life, and I planned for them to be for a long time. Pat's alibi was confirmed, and she was eliminated as a suspect. Now, Bob Bean had another idea. There's only two things that can come between brothers. It's money and a woman. Immediately after Sam was killed, the only person that I had in mind who I thought did it was my ex-husband. I have since then had time to wonder, you know, if somebody else could have had a reason for wanting Sam dead. As if there weren't enough, Pat came up with yet another suspect. She says that after Sammy's death, his twin brother, Danny, made an astonishing confession to one of his girlfriends. She just said that Danny Wheeler told her that he was in love with me, that he had been in love with me for a long time, that he thought about me every night, that he wanted to hold me in his arms every night. There's not an ounce of truth in those allegations. If she married my brother, she was gonna be like a sister to me, and my family doesn't go in for incest. Even before Sam got involved with her, I didn't think she was a good-looking woman. On the morning that Sam's body was discovered, his father and Sergeant Height broke the news to Danny and Pat. He's dead, son. Danny, I need to know who's Pat believes that Danny's over-the-top reaction was meant to hide the fact that he was actually 
the killer. Why don't you go get Bob Bean? He's trying to help us out. He's down the road. Why don't you go get him? You know it's him. I'm not sure. Why don't you go get him? I think most of his behavior when he first found out that, that Sam was dead was a show, was to make everybody else think that he was uh, feeling some way that he wasn't. Why is she lying? It makes me wonder. What is she hiding? It makes me wonder. God knows what that did to me when my brother died. And why she would say things like that makes me wonder about her. Maybe Bob Bean didn't kill my brother. Maybe it was Pat that killed my brother. And Danny's alibi? On the night of Sam's murder, he was seen bar hopping. Pat uh, Sneed, Bob Bean, and, and Danny Wheeler provided alibis. We've corroborated them. They've uh, taken a polygraph. Uh, they've shown no deception. Uh, they are no more uh, of a suspect in, in, in our eyes than, than anyone else. Update. With the case stalled, Sammy Wheeler's parents hired a private investigator. What he discovered was that despite the charges and counter charges, those closest to Sammy were not involved. The PI found a witness who said that he saw a man named Guy Price shoot Sammy in a random act of violence. Price was arrested, tried, and found guilty of murder. He served his time and has been released. Next, authorities need your help to solve the murder of a young mother. Ash County, North Carolina. What do you got, Doug? Female. She's, she's been here a while. A body yeah. is discovered at the bottom of a 200-foot cliff that the locals call the jumping off place. Police quickly identify the body as Sherry Lyle Hart. She is a local woman who disappeared without a trace 11 months earlier. Sherry was last seen alive outside a local restaurant. The 24-year-old divorcee was supposed to meet a date. Sherry's daughter, April, was devastated. I just thought she hated me and didn't want to come back because she had me. And she didn't feel like she was responsible for me. And I just didn't think she loved me anymore. For months afterwards, April heard rumors that her mother had run off to Florida with a lover. Investigators immediately reopened the case. Sherry. Hi, guys. How you doing? Well, I was supposed to have a date about a half hour ago, but... They located a witness who had seen Sherry on the night she vanished. She was with two high school friends, Richard Bear and Jeffrey Burgess. Take her just out, cruising around. Cruising around. No. How long would that have been, cruising? Police interrogated Bear and Burgess separately. OK. What time would that have been? Nine, nine o'clock. Are you sure about that? No, I'm not sure. It could have been 9.05. It could have been 8.55. I don't, I don't keep a watch on me and check in every minute, OK? We had witnesses that saw you together after 9 o'clock. Look, right. look, let me tell you something. It was dark. It was cold. We dropped her off by her car. I don't know what time it was. Richard Bear volunteered little information. Detectives were forced to pursue other leads. We interviewed uh, many people. And as a result of those interviews, we feel that we have developed a scenario as to what occurred that evening. So where is this place we're going anyway? I figure we go cruising first. Uh, a couple of buddies of mine are down there. Meet up with them and then maybe go to the Twilight Club afterwards. At some point in time, this uh, riding around led them to an area, and Sherry Hart asked to make a rest stop. Authorities allege that Sherry and the two men pull off the highway about a quarter mile Take from the jumping off place. You know what, Jeff? What's that? I think the woods are a dangerous place for a little girl. I think you might be right. <laughs> Oh, hey, sure, sure, sure. 
I thought I said. Richard, take your come time. on, let's go to the car. No. Stop. Richard. Give me a let's... kiss. No, Richard, stop it! Richard! Leave me alone! Stop it, Richard! Stop it! 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 Richard Bear was apparently carrying a handgun. What are you doing? Shut up and stay in the car, all right? You're hurting me. No! <laughs> Richard Bear and Jeffrey Burgess were charged with the murder of Sherry Hart. Turn to your right. A conviction could have led straight to the gas chamber. But four months after his arrest, Bear escaped from the county jail. Burgess was released on bail pending his friend's recapture. Years later, the trial has yet to begin. We let those people down. We let the victim down. And we'd certainly like to have an opportunity to get him back, to let them know that we want to see justice done. This is probably as brutal a crime as you will ever uh, encounter because uh, the fright that that victim had to feel for several minutes before uh, she went over that clear. She was an outgoing person. She liked people. She liked to have fun. She was a mother that loved her daughter very much. She thought more of April than anybody or anything. You won't never get behind me. I can't take looking at her grave knowing she's down there. And I want her to be here with me so I can just give her a hug and just have her in my life again. The FBI still includes Richard Lynn Bear on its list of most wanted fugitives. Bear stands five feet eight inches and when last seen weighed 175 pounds. He has green eyes and may have a panther tattooed on his right forearm. Rewards totaling $12,000 have been offered in this case. If you have any information regarding this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, police track down an accused murderer who's been on the run for 20 years. West Philadelphia just off the University of Pennsylvania campus. Philadelphia Police Homicide Unit, we have a search warrant. After a year-long investigation, police launch a raid. Are you Ira Einhorn? Yeah. They are totally unprepared for what they would find in the apartment of Ira Einhorn. Ira Einhorn was a counterculture hero, a war protester, and an organizer of the first Earth Day, a pro-ecology festival still celebrated every year. Einhorn was also buddies with peace movement leaders like Abby Hoffman. Fortune 500 corporations hired Einhorn for advice on trends of the future. He even ran for mayor of Philadelphia. There was, however, a dark side of Ira Einhorn that the crowds and the news cameras never saw. He was jealous, abusive, self-centered, and he was the prime suspect in the disappearance of his ex-girlfriend, Holly Maddox. Just like everyone else, Holly was seduced by Einhorn's charm when they first met. I've never seen you in here before. What's your name? Holly. Ira. She was blown away because the force of his personality was considerable. And on the other hand, there was Holly, who was really 
not at a solid stage in her, in, in her life and was susceptible to a big come on, to a big con. And really within a few days, they were living with, uh, together. You coming to the, to the rally in DC? Of course I am. For the Maddox family, Ira Einhorn was, was the ultimate nightmare. He was a, a long-haired, not terribly clean, uh, hippie type. Ira, I don't think we should try and get arrested. Why not? 50,000 freaks get arrested, what are they gonna do? You know, throw us in the Coliseum? When he did come down and spend time in our home with us, he was uh, rude. Um, he was overbearing to Holly, he kind of ordered her around. Andrea Boyce worked with Holly in a neighborhood co-op. I remember a morning we were trying to get the store stocked. And while we were taking our break, she turned her head in such a way that I noticed a mark on her neck. What's up with those bruises? Oh, nothing. I just bumped into something. Now, those look like hand marks to me. Holly, is someone hurting you? I already did this. As the relationship progressed, Holly did gather more self-esteem. She found she could do things for herself. Ira was abusive to her. Just a friend. I'm not asking him home, am I? You understand what this is all about, yeah, okay? I, I, I can't By July of 1977, Holly had had enough. She walked out on Einhorn, leaving everything she owned. She ended up at a beach resort near New York City, where she began a romance with Sal Lapidus. She was just wonderful, curious, very bright, knew what was going on. For those many weeks, we were kind of inseparable. It was the start of, of possibly something big. Einhorn called her, and he was going nuts. He said, in her words, he was off the wall. Uh, he threatened to throw all her clothing and all her belongings out into the street unless she came down to Philadelphia immediately to come see him. Uh, he could not handle the fact that she was going with this other man. I didn't have a bad feeling that Holly was going to Philadelphia. I had a bad, very bad feeling when she didn't return. Sal Lapidus and Holly's friends reported her missing. So Philadelphia detectives interviewed Ira Einhorn. His explanation was that he had gone into the shower, that she told him she was going to the store, uh, and that he never saw her again. She just walked off into the sunset. Holly's disappearance did not make any sense to my, my parents because she was too close to her family. She would not turn her back and just disappear. The Maddox family hired two former FBI agents to investigate. They found a couple who had gone to the movies with Einhorn and Holly. It was during the same weekend that Holly went to pick up her belongings, and it was the last time she was known to be alive. Bye, Barbara. A few days later, Einhorn asked friends to help him dump a large trunk into a nearby river. He claimed that the trunk was filled with secret Russian documents. I told Kathy we that okay, we Okay, okay, you don't want to help. You don't have to help. Finally, the tenants living below Einhorn complained to investigators about a dreadful stench seeping into their apartment. Here's this stain up in the ceiling here in the closet. You can see there's some sort of a brown sticky liquid started seeping through. Oh, yeah. That report brought authorities to Einhorn's apartment. By then, Holly Maddox had been missing for 18 months. Once I opened the door, I could smell kind of a, a decaying smell. And spending years as a homicide detective, I knew that smell to be body smell. And I thought, uh-oh, she may be here. You have a key to this? Looks like we found Holly. You found what you found. There was a sickness, a sadness that uh, Holly Maddox was found, but then there was kind of a, a, a feel good that we were going to lock up Ira Einhorn for killing her. Einhorn soon came up with an explanation. Are you guilty? No. All right, now don't put questions like that. He claimed that the FBI and the CIA had framed him by planting Holly's body in his closet. 
courtroom, if we may, without questioning. Einhorn's attorney, one-time Philadelphia DA and now U.S. Senator Arlen Specter, pulled off the impossible. Bail for Ira Einhorn. I was offended when they allowed him out on bail because in my t entire career, somebody who's charged with murder never gets out on bail. And when I sat in that courtroom and I watched the parade of prominent people march before the bar of the court and sing the praises of Ira Einhorn, who was a murderer, who was a murderer, but nobody wanted to admit it. I said, this guy will never, ever stand trial. He will take off. Two days before the start of his trial, while out on bail, Ira Einhorn fled the country. Airport. 12 years passed. Finally, Philadelphia authorities tried Einhorn in absentia for the murder of Holly Maddox. It took the jury only two hours to find Ira Einhorn guilty. In 1997, Interpol tracked Einhorn down to a farmhouse in southern France. He had been living there for several years under an assumed name. Four years after he was captured, Einhorn was extradited to the United States and retried for the murder of Holly Maddox. He was found guilty and he is currently serving a life term without the possibility of parole. Next, a fugitive police chief accused of murder has been arrested thanks to our viewers. We recently told you the story of 34-year-old Anna Anton, whose body was found in a remote field outside of Lyons, Nebraska. She had been shot twice. Upon observing the surroundings around Anna, it was uh, very apparent that uh, she did not succumb her death there that the body had been moved. Okay, Rain, let's go over here by the chair and work our way In back. Anna's apartment, lab technicians found traces of blood in the living room and dining room, as well as on the steps leading to the apartment upstairs. Okay, we're picking up some here. The man who lived in that apartment was 36-year-old Greg Webb, who had been the Lions chief of police for eight years. I'm gonna introduce Hi. you to a friend of mine. Investigators learned that Webb and Anna had been romantically involved. Police theorized that Webb was seeing another woman at the same time and that he murdered Anna when she confronted him. While detectives were collecting evidence in Anna's apartment, Webb was making his escape. He disappeared with his life savings of $3,000. A warrant was issued for Webb's arrest. He was charged with first-degree murder. After our broadcast, an alert viewer in Florida contacted us. He recognized Webb as a man he knew as Jim Weber, a construction worker. Well, when I, when I was watching it and they showed Greg when he came on, um, they, inter they mentioned him as Greg Webb, and I knew him as Gregory James Weber, and he went by Jim Weber. So uh, I just put the two together. Like I say, it just looked just like him. So it was quite a shock. Florida had faxed me uh, photographs of the driver's license that was issued under Gregory James Weber. And once I did see the photographs, I knew that that was Gregory uh, John Webb. The arrest went very well. We, uh, there wasn't any resistance whatsoever. We took him by surprise. He was arrested at an off-site construction site. Webb was returned to Nebraska to stand trial for murder. He was convicted and sentenced to 19 years in prison. He was released after serving eight years. The Battle of Gettysburg raged for three long days. Each evening, the soldiers would pick their way through the battlefield, searching for missing comrades. Some people believe that search continues to this day. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. At the height of the Civil War, this was hell on earth. Three days of brutal combat left some 50,000 Union and Confederate casualties. The creeks literally ran red with blood. Some say Gettysburg is still haunted by the ghost of those cut down in battle. At Gettysburg, there was so much emotional energy expended in such a short period of time. From the 15-year-old kid who was scared to death that he'd never make it home, 
or the 40-year-old man who'd just been shot through the lungs and was dying and thinking about his family, you have to think that some of it must remain. Many of the ghostly sightings have been reported by Civil War reenactors. Dressed in period costumes, they restage the battle blow by blow. Ray Hawk says he and a friend were approached by a figure too realistic to be just another reenactor. I think I've seen a ghost. I think this guy had original equipment on, original coat. Everything to me points out that it was original. Hard day, huh, boys? Yeah, it was. Ray says the soldier handed them each two authentic looking cartridges. When they looked up, the mysterious figure had vanished. Where'd he go? I simply don't know where he got to. I have no clue. This is one of the four rounds that he gave myself and my friend. Live ammunition hasn't been allowed at Gettysburg for over 100 years. Ray Hawk, a university expert, determined that the cartridges were genuine Civil War issue. Vintage, 1863. Years later, some friends were at Gettysburg for the battle reenactments. One evening, they hiked along a creek called Bloody Run. I was walking along with my wife, and she had stopped me about halfway up the trail. Look out! He appeared to be a man laying there, but he wasn't solid like you and I are. I mean, he was, he was more of a hazy mist. He was shivering because it looked like he was in a lot of pain. I couldn't go no further. Emotionally, I just broke down and cried. I was shaken. I had to actually have somebody come back and lead me out, out of the trail. The terror of Gettysburg was not limited to the battlefield. Army surgeons, lacking medicine and proper instruments, handled most injuries with one quick treatment, amputation. Many of the men underwent amputations of limbs without any anesthetic whatsoever, except perhaps a shot of good old-fashioned army whiskey. So the Civil War hospital then was probably as close to a descent into hell on Earth as uh, these Civil War soldiers would, would have ever gotten to. This building, Pennsylvania Hall, was a field hospital during the battle. Today, it's the offices of Gettysburg College. But some say the cries of the wounded still echo here. It was late, close to midnight. Two school administrators were alone in the building. Did you press one? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Well, maybe somebody's in the basement. Oh my god. The stench of, of a hospital was, was all around. And as they peered out of this, of course, they began to panic. There was no place to go. Suddenly, one of the orderlies turned to them and looked at them beseechingly as if he needed help with this horrible task that he was doing, or perhaps help to get out of this uh, forced incarceration he'd been in for the last 13 decades. That night, the two officials told their story to a campus security officer. Something frightened them. I can't explain it, although I don't believe in ghosts. I guess to a certain extent, I believe that they saw maybe what they said they saw, uh, only because I know them as credible people. Are these ghostly sightings imagined? Perhaps the spirits of Gettysburg soldiers are here and will remain here forever. Coming up. Maybe you can help track down this man, accused of kidnapping his former girlfriend. In a small Missouri town called Mexico, a quiet day turns violent. The woman being attacked is 19-year-old Denise Williams. The gunman is her ex-boyfriend, 31-year-old Randall Utterback. They had met at a party a year and a half earlier. To the naive schoolgirl, Randall seemed just dangerous enough 
to be exciting. I'm glad you had a good time. I yeah. think my friends really liked you. Oh, good. I met Randall a week before graduation. I just thought he was the cutest thing. and He had been known around town for his motorcycles, and he owned a mountain lion at the time. Everyone had talked real highly of him. He was really outgoing. He would take me out to nice places and concerts. And then after two weeks of Randall and I being together, it all changed. It was gradual. He started out saying, don't wear makeup, don't wear hairspray, don't wear perfume. And then it grew to, don't hang out with this person. So you have to choose them or me. Denise Williams was in way over her head. She says that Randall Utterback became more and more abusive, controlling, and dangerous. He was obsessed with her, and he wasn't about to let her go. When Denise went away to college, she had hoped that the distance would improve the relationship. No such luck. Oh, Randall, you scared me. Hey, Denise. Hey, I called you this morning. Where were you? I had to go to class. Yeah, I know, but you said you'd wait for my phone call. Randall was very controlling and manipulative. I'd have to call Randall if I was going down to the cafeteria. Just in case Randall called and I wasn't there to accept his phone call, he'd think I'd be out with some other people or having friends doing something that I wasn't supposed to do. Denise's family was shocked when Randall talked her into enrolling in a community college closer to him. He had me convinced he was the only one there for me because he had got me so isolated from my family and my friends. And I got to the point where I started to believe that. No, I didn't. It looks fine. Well, Denise, I'm just trying to help you, all right? You want my well, help or not? Several months passed. The abusive pattern continued until Denise reached her breaking point. Are you calling me a liar, Denise? Randall, I'm not calling you a liar. I'm just telling you this is the way it looks. <sighs> You're an idiot. You know that? I Stupid. would be called names. I'd be tore down. I wasn't allowed to have an opinion with Randall. Denise, that's it. I've had it. We're finished. I was relieved. I wanted to get away from him. I had just had enough. Randall was stunned when Denise didn't come crawling back to him. Hey, Randall, I, I just don't want to see you anymore, OK? I've been upset. I, I can't sleep. No, Randall, don't you Just give me five minutes, Denise. Just leave me alone. Just give me five minutes. I just need don't to talk to you. Me. Randall Utterback would not go away without a fight. Denise says he began to stalk her waiting until she was alone and unprotected. Doing. Randall hit the back of my car and it ran me off the road. And he told me that if I didn't take him back, something bad would happen to someone I love. He wanted me to marry him. I told Randall I wouldn't marry him. Randall Utterback was arrested for felonious restraint and aggravated stalking. Hey, listen, uh, the sheriff said I could call my lawyer and let him know I'm here. He was in jail for a week before posting bond. A restraining order barred him from seeing or talking to Denise. Denise finally began to relax. But she let her guard down a little too soon. I was driving home from school, and I saw this car behind me. I didn't think it was him. I thought it was just some school kids driving home from school. Next thing I know, that car pulls up beside me, and it was Randall. What are you doing? Again, he's motioning me to pull over. And I would, and I sped up. And as I sped up, he sped up and went beside me again. Denise? No. Denise, get out of the car. Denise, Denise, wait, Denise, Denise, wait, Denise, Denise, Denise tried to spray Randall with mace. In the struggle, Randall dropped his gun. Shut up! I just needed to tell you, 
Denise, that, that I love you and I want you back in my life, okay? That's all I'm asking for. No, Randall, I can't. How can you expect me to do that after what you just been done I just to want me? to start it! I need to start over! I need another chance! Now give it to me! And then he said that if I wouldn't take him back, there was no need for him to live in, and he asked me to kill him. He asked me to stab him through the heart. Denise pleaded with Randall to stop the car. Denise, just, just yeah, tell him it ain't my gun. Look at all those people. I oh, know, Denise. They're I know, Denise. That's my I just car wait, Denise. Denise. Denise, 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 shut up, Denise. God, I hate it when you do that. If you don't say exactly what I told you to say, I'm going to take you out of this state, and you'll never see your family again. You understand that? Yeah. I love you. Denise's father and a sheriff's deputy, along with several other people, had already gathered around Denise's car. Daddy! Denise, honey, are you all right? Oh my God! A deputy immediately began to question Denise. Randall, Daddy! Please, Denise, come back, come back to your car. He then drove her to the emergency room to have her checked out. I just want to see my dad. He'll be over there. He'll be at the hospital when you get there. No, that's him! That's Randall? That's him, right there! All right, okay. Just stay calm, Denise. Stay right there. You're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. You're fine. Put your left hand. Reach out. Open the door. Keep your hands in the air. Face away from me. Randall Utterback was charged with stalking, felonious restraint, and armed criminal action. He was imprisoned without bond. Several months later, while being transported to the hospital, he managed to escape. Utterback is still on the loose. As of today, I'm still living in fear. I don't know when he'll come back, but I have a feeling he will. I don't go anywhere by myself. I'm just scared he's gonna come back and I won't be able to convince him a third time to let me go. Randall Lauderback stands 5 feet 8 inches tall and weighs 148 pounds. He has reddish brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.